increase awareness and the meeting will be recorded. You might've just gotten an alert about that. Yeah, sorry about um, that, Amanda. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so the social justice lecture series uh, is aiming to increase awareness of social justice principles in our professional practice, and also to bring attention to how libraries and archives are, are supporting or failing to support crucial research on issues related to social justice. Um, the first season is entitled Stories and Silences, Research on Race in the Middle East, uh, and we are hosting researchers working on race and racism in the Middle East, broadly defined, and or its diasporas. Um, uh, so after this talk, um, the next will be featuring Dr. Rachel, Sh Rachel Shine speaking about Blackness and Medieval Arabic Popular Narrative on November 19th. Um, you can find more information about the series on Mela's blog or feel free to reach out to me. So. For today's event, which uh, is the pride of our series, we are so lucky to have today as our speaker, Dr. Lenisa Kitchener. Um, Dr. Kitchener started as Chief of the African and Middle Eastern Division at the Library of Congress at the beginning of August. Before that, she served as Director of Education and Scholarly Initiatives at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African Art, where she oversaw new initiatives in scholarly research, educational programming, and audience outreach. Uh, Dr. Kitchener holds a doctorate in African Studies and Research from Howard University. An active member of the Modern Language Association, she was elected to a four-year term as an executive board member between 2012 and 2016, and she has caught, uh, taught courses in multi-ethnic studies and African literature, film, and visual arts at Howard University and American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Kitchener's talk today is entitled Confronting Critical Conversations in American Cultural Institutions. Um, and I will hand the mic off to her now. And at the end of her talk, I can moderate the Q&A, but feel free to type in questions as they come to you. Dr. Kitchener, thanks so much for coming and take it away. Thank you, Amanda. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Lanisa Kitchener, Chief of the African and Middle Eastern Division at the Library of Congress. By way of introduction, the African and Middle Eastern Division includes the entire Arab world and North Africa, Turkey, Iran, Central Asia, and the Caucasus, Armenia, and Georgia, all of Sub-Saharan Africa, and Hebraica and Judaica worldwide. We represent 78 countries, and we cover over 60 different languages, and we collect material in these languages where publications are available. I'd like to start by just congratulating Mela on the convening of the 48th annual meeting of the uh, association. It is remarkable, even as we are doing this in a virtual format, to do it together in this way, when so much could have prevented us for, for, from doing so. So I'm delighted to be here. I want you to know that for me personally, it is an honor and a privilege to join you on this occasion. Madam President Robin Dougherty, Mela officers and members, thank you. Um, I am humbled and, and grateful beyond measure for your invitation. And I think it's appropriate for me to also extend thanks to Azu Teskan, Amanda Steinberg, and to my own esteemed colleagues in the Ahmed Division at the Library of Congress, without whom today's presentation would not be possible. Joan Weeks, Muhannad Salhi, Harad Dinavari, and Lee Avdoyan, who remains supportive of and active in our division, even in his retirement. I would also like to acknowledge our colleagues in Cairo, William Kopecki, and his team. To all of you, thank you for the privilege of sharing this space, this time, and these ideas with such a distinguished cohort of industry leaders. And of course, thank you for all that you do every day to foster a greater sense of global community through advancement of knowledge on, around, and about one of the most misunderstood, but also one of the most remarkable parts of the world, the Middle East. I'm excited to join with each and every one of you, librarians, curators, scholars, foot soldiers, and forward thinkers on the front lines of our field, confronting some of the most difficult issues of our time. Issues that have for far too many centuries crippled the essence of our humanity and stained the fabric of our societies. Issues that have survived and cast the darkest imaginable shadow over seasons upon seasons of our lives. 
issues that can only meet their full demise through the diligence, the determination, and the undying courage of folks like you. You who are hard at work on campuses and in cultural institutions across America and beyond from Indiana to Abu Dhabi, Canada to Chicago, Texas to Yale, and on and on. I think I heard Japan and the UK all around the world tackling and training successor generations to tackle the overwhelming weight and enduring legacies of the isms, racism, sexism, classism, colorism, primitivism, nationalism, and the parallel and at times overlapping challenges of discrimination on the basis of religious, linguistic, and ethnic differences. In my 20 some odd years as an Africanist, I have often felt that the isms are a bottomless pit, almost like a black hole with gravitational force so strong that seemingly nothing can withstand or escape their pull. The isms threaten to eat our humanity whole and alive unless we are bold enough to envision and venture radically new approaches to what we do as caretakers of world culture and proponents of knowledge production. I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so discussing what I believe to be the central most significant responsibilities of cultural institutions today. I'm going to make the case that if we put the full force of our collective power toward the complete realization of these responsibilities, then we will have prepared the very best weapons against the isms that plague our world. Now I can share at the onset that for me, it's not necessarily instruction, interpretation or inference that is our charge. Instead, ours is a twofold responsibility to ensure inclusivity and to engender radical curiosity. Engendering radical curiosity means feeding and fostering the natural instinct to, to inquire so that it is not simply an impulse, but an insatiable appetite to explore the unknown. And it strikes me as interesting that the genius of humankind has found ways and is unafraid to explore unknown worlds like Mars, Venus, Mercury, Jupiter, and the moon. And that it has discovered in these spaces rocky terrains, moons made of ice, gas-filled planets, and more. That each new discovery invites us to delve even deeper in search of more that these discoveries feed our wildest imaginations and form our popular culture and inspire unbelievable innovation. It strikes me as interesting that on the basis of this hunger for knowledge about the unknown spheres of outer space, humankind is now preparing to launch a probe into the never before explored middle world of psyche. But that, we can, but that we are somehow unable to locate common ground to explore the depth and contours of our own communities so that we might peacefully coexist with equal freedoms right here on earth. I wonder you know, if we can probe the unknown metal world of Psyche, which is nearly 200 million miles away from our earth's outer surface, can we not also probe the unknown worlds of our own humanity? For me, one of the greatest challenges before us as principals responsible for stocking the reading rooms of our world is to create in our patrons, our patrons an incessant desire to look even more closely, to listen even more deeply, to read even more widely, not necessarily in search of answers, because answers suggest a sense of finality or a sense of conclusion. No, the idea here is to, to foster such insatiable thirst and desire and, and hunger for curiosity, uh, such that the process of seeking understanding is dynamic and everlasting, because we don't know what we don't know. And stopping short when we think we found comfortable solutions leaves us vulnerable to overlooking the hidden histories, peoples, and cultures of the world, which in turn leaves us vulnerable to duplicating long-standing and problematic habits of erasure, habits that are breeding grounds for either knowingly or inadvertently 
perpetuating harmful prejudices. Permit me to pull from the field of visual art to illustrate my point. I'm going to take a second to try to share my screen. If you could just bear with me for just a second here. I can do this without glitch. Can you, can you see my screen here? I want you to take a peek at this image. Um, and let's just see for just a second. I want you to hang on to this image and I'm going to return to it in just a second, but I want it to sit for a minute. The title of the image is What Don't You See When You Look at Me? And it is um, a photograph by South African photographer Zanella Muholi. What don't you see when you look at me? I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and maybe come back to that image uh, in just a second as I speak through it um, for just a moment here. I don't know if I'm... Am I still sharing my screen? No, you're, you're good. Okay, all right. So for me, Zanella Muholi's image and the question in it, in it, that it raises, what don't you see when you look at me, uh, is it's just a remarkable illustration of the essence of the dilemma that I'm attempting to, to discuss this morning. The image depicts a scarred black skinned forearm alongside a midriff covered with a white top, a black belt and a gray bottom. Everything in the image is off center and nothing appears in its entirety. Consequently, the subject of the shot is uncertain. It is uncertain whether the image depicts a male, female or non-binary subject, whether the forearm belongs to the body, whether the body is whole or disfigured, alive or dead whether the body is standing or reclining. It is also unclear whether the hand to the forearm is pocketed or exposed, whether the bottoms are pants or a skirt, whether the body is real or plastic. These defining attributes are each a matter of perspective, perspective which is necessarily subjective and incomplete. The viewer cannot know what it cannot see, but remains nonetheless prone to reaching conclusions. The power of the image, therefore, emerges from what is shown as much as it does from all that is out of view. Yet in and through flagging the subject's black skin with a gaping pink flesh wound, Moholy manages to convey provocative messaging about presence and absence, about the ineffectiveness of sight as a definitive explanatory tool, and about the significance of peeling back layers and quite literally cutting deeper into surface layers to access alternative possibilities of meaning, being, and belonging. I'm going to try to share the screen just one more time so you can, you can get a glimpse again at, that, uh, at the image. Everything is off center, nothing in it is in full view. And yet, at least for me, and I imagine for the most of you, uh, we are drawn to that forearm, that scarred forearm and pink flesh wound. So I've stopped sharing again, I think. Can you see, am I still sharing? No. Nope. You're good. Okay, all right. So the title of the photograph, What Don't You See When You Look at Me, is as provocative as the image itself. It not only challenges viewers to confront their assumptions, but also to examine the image from an alternative angle that privileges recognition of the unknown instead of perceived expertise as a starting place for understanding. It exposes the impossibility of knowing it all as it offers opportunities to probe the self and the other in equal measure. The image captures and reflects the rhetorical qualities of its title 
And the title provides a plain answer to the question it posits, which is you don't know what you don't see when you look at me because you can't. You've got to dig deeper and deeper still. It is in and through radical curiosity that we will discover the undiscoverable, that we will learn to hear the silences of the oppressed and weave of those faint whispers, stories that can help us to better understand and appreciate the beauty, the richness and the diversity of our humanity in all its complexity. We do not know what we do not see when we look at Maholi's photograph, just as we do not know what we do not see when we look at each other. But if we commit to engendering radical curiosity and undying curiosity, then we can rest assured that someone somewhere, perhaps one of us, will help us to see curiosity and radical curiosity, in fact, radical curiosity. And the discoveries that are born of it are our lifeblood. The other critical role of cultural institutions today is ensuring inclusivity. Ensuring inclusivity means doggedly pursuing and insisting upon equitable representation of content, style, and perspective in our collection development strategies. On the surface, this seems simple enough. Follow the tenets of the Library Bill of Rights, collect books, books and resources for the interest, formation, and enlightenment of all people, provide materials representing all points of view, challenge censorship, challenge censorship. However, there is a great distance to travel on the road between conceptualizing inclusivity as a necessity and actually achieving it. Ensuring inclusivity means probing the boundary conditions of our field, grappling with and overcoming deeply embedded structural challenges that shape and inform our work from our collection practices to who we hire, who we serve, who we promote and how. Ensuring inclusivity means doggedly pursuing equitable representation of content, perspective, and style. It means ripping off the Band-Aid, as it were, to expose, redress, and fill the gaping holes in our collections and in our thinking. It means breaking down silos and working and seeing across the aisles. It means being the person in the room who is unafraid to cry foul ball, but it also means doing the deeper work of putting forth constructive and actionable solutions that don't alienate. And for people like me who may often find themselves as the first or the only in the room with the seat at the table in a position of influence, um, it means mustering the courage to bring our whole selves in authentically and confidently. Ensuring inclusivity means breaking down barriers and building bridges to achieving the highest form of togetherness, of humanity. And so as this marks the 75th anniversary of the Near East section at the Library of Congress, it seems befitting for me to reflect upon and draw inspiration from the section's work in this critical area of inclusivity. Our greatest contributions to engendering curiosity and ensuring inclu inclusivity is evidenced in our collections. For example, we've made great efforts to collect the works and publications of a variety of marginalized communities. Examples include the Kurds in the Arab world, Iran and Turkey. We've been collecting Kurdish works for decades and many of these works uh, were published abroad because they were not publishable in Kurdish homelands. These publications, whether newspapers or books, could have been published in Egypt, where very few, if any, Kurds live, as well as in Sweden, Germany, and other parts of the Western world, but they are now available at the Library of Congress. Another example is the Assyrians. We collect in Aramaic, whether from Iraq, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, we also have works from the Amazai of North Africa. In fact, we are one of the only institutions that collect materials published in the native tongue of the Amazai. 
Now, we should keep in mind that refugees are also discriminated against. And this could include refugees in Arab worlds, Arab, ref Arab refugees in other parts of the Arab world. An example here is the Palestinians, one of the oldest and largest refugee populations in the world. Many countries in which they, the Palestinian live, many countries in which the Palestinians live are in fact, um, places with refugee camps for Palestinians that do not allow Palestinian people to have the same rights as would others. In Lebanon, for example, a Palestinian cannot buy a car without a, a Lebanese person vouching for them. This vouching is the equivalent of a co-signer. So as you might imagine, um, published works on these experiences um, are hard to come by, but they are collected and represented in the works at the Library of Congress. Yet another example would be the Copts, a Christian religious minority in Egypt, where we collect their works, primarily Bibles and sometimes dictionaries, which have covered and have been translated into their own languages, since Coptic is primarily a liturgical language. The same applies to the Baha'i in Iran, uh, where we collect religious works and otherwise. We also collect works and studies that deal with many of those issues which might be banned in the countries that they deal with. Yet another example here is South Sudan, where we at the Library of Congress have a web archive on events there. Uh, and also, uh, we have uh, collections representing the Muslim Brotherhood, which uh, for decades was uh, banned in Egypt. Through our commitment to inclusive collection practices, we give voice to the silenced and oppressed communities in the Middle East and in the 78 countries represented in our division. I've spoken to you today about the role of cultural institutions in confronting the critical issues of our time. And I've highlighted some of the ways that we do this work in the Near East section at the Library of Congress. As I bring my comments to a close with hope that we'll have a dynamic discussion to follow, I'd like to put forward something of a call to action, or at least five things that we can do right now to make our cultural institutions even more impactful, even more effective in confronting the isms. We can be unafraid. We can be resilient. We must be authentic. We must move beyond rhetoric to affect real world tangible change. And we must stay the course in and through the work of ensuring inclusivity and engendering radical curiosity about untold people's histories and cultures, we can begin to tackle the evils of the isms that have marginalized communities forever in flux, forever in fear, forever invisible, forever in poverty and forever in prayer. Through collecting their stories, we can free marginalized communities, underrepresented communities, silenced communities from forever fighting what American civil rights champion, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. described as the degenerating sense of nobodiness. And through this work, we can begin to identify and measure in full the richness, the beauty and the depth of our own personhood, as well as the personhood of others in and through radical curiosity and ensuring inclusivity, we can find a better way. Thank you. I'm opening it up and turning it over to you, Amanda, for, for questions and conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Kitchener. That was really inspiring. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat as of now. I think everyone was just too busy listening, but uh, if anyone has any questions that they wanted to pose, uh, you can type it in the chat or um, feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself to ask in person. 
if, if I can, Amanda, I'd just like to comment. Um, that was, uh, thank you so much, um, Lenisa, for that uh, keynote. That makes me feel like um, I, I remember now why I, I love my job. So thank you so much. <laughs> it was uh, very inspiring. Okay, we do have a question in the chat um, asking if you have uh, con collected, if the Library of Congress is collecting materials on the Hazara ethnic group in Afghanistan. So here's an opportunity where I get to flag my, I'm too new to answer that question <laughs> card. Um, I, as you might imagine, uh, with uh, being now just a little bit shy of three months into my role at the Library of Congress and still uh, acclimating myself to the very rich collections that we have. So unfortunately, I don't have a direct answer to that question. I'm trying to look on this screen and I see my colleague Muhammad. And if I could just turn to my colleague in the spirit of community and ask if he might be able to give a more direct answer. And there he is with a reply. Yes, indeed we do. Thank you, Muhammad. So I have a question if you if you don't mind, um, less about the library and more about yourself. Um, sure. And how, how, so, I know it's the Africa and Middle East division, obviously. So um, your previous work applies to the Africa division too. But how do you how do you feel like that your experiences in in the um, African cultural studies uh, um, world um, applies to the Middle East studies uh, section, and 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 how does that help you figure out these connections? Yeah, it's a very good question, and I tell you. It's one that I appreciate. When I initially received the invitation, I thought, geez, I'm an Africanist. What on earth can I say to a community of scholars, curators, and librarians of the Middle East? And then I had to check myself. Uh, and I had to check myself because as we all know, the connections that uh, exist between the Middle East and Africa and the world writ large are long and deep. And one of the greatest challenges that I think we have to overcome as scholars in the field, uh, particularly in and through our scholarly associations and our cultural institutions, is breaking down some of those barriers that force us to think in very limited terms. The Africanist is the Africanist exclusively. Um, and this isn't to say anything about the unique uh, distinctions in our respective fields, but if we go back far enough, what we will find is two things. First, that Africa is the birthplace of humanity. And so there is quite a bit that we can learn about ourselves and the longer history of humankind in and through that lens. But also that if we move even forward into the present moment of our time, that nothing exists in a vacuum. In fact, what we are doing is playing in a broader field of area studies where there is at times a spirit of competition, but so much more that can be achieved through collaboration. And, you know, when I think about the African Studies Association, and I think about the uh, Middle East Studies Association, these are born of the same general period, right? When we think about, um, you know, uh, the collection uh, at the Library of Congress. I mean, one could argue that the collecting of material from the Middle East dates back to Jefferson's Quran um, and uh, the, the purchase of it, the acquisition of it, uh, the Library of Congress. But we can, we can, we can fast forward to, to, to the 60s, um, you know, the very late 50s into the 60s where we see, you know, following, um, well, actually we can go to 1945, um, and beyond after World War II, where we start to see this widespread focus, at least in the United States, on area studies programs, partly because of the strategic imperative. Now we've shifted beyond that strategic imperative to look at cultural uh, um, concerns. And if we are talking about culture, then we must look at these cultures and communities in historical context. And that brings them right back together again. So in answer to your question, Amanda, what does my background in history as an Africanist uh, have, to, have to offer 
uh, to understanding about the Middle East? Well, I would say everything, just as everything about the backgrounds of all on this conversation can help to inform understanding about Africa. Thank you. Um, so we did have another question asking about um, ideas or what the best way you think is to advocate for underrepresented groups in collection development policies specifically. You know, that's a good question. Um, in my own experience, and I'm drawing from time now at the Smithsonian Institution, um, it I'm going to try to answer this question in the best way I can, making it applicable to the library. Um, and what I often find is that we've got to make the case for what we're collecting, get it through a review committee and get it signed off on. But in the process of making that case, in the process of justifying what we collect, why and how, I think we've got to first start with as is implied in the question, our policies, our policies around collecting. Now, I'll give an example here. When I was at the Smithsonian Institution, um, we had a broad charge to collect in African art writ large. And it took one brave soul, one of our curators who championed well, first, they took the time to understand our collections and then took the time to realize the gaps in those collections. And the gap was that there was a gross underrepresentation of women artists and an even grosser representation or misrepresentation, underrepresentation of Black women artists. And in and through understanding the gaps and the weaknesses, that remarkable curator was able to bring to the senior leadership the proposal, but really the case to make the case for why it was necessary to adjust our collection policies in that area so that we could have a more inclusive collection of, of works um, to include women and particularly Black women artists. And in and through that work, that curator helped to change the course of our exhibition strategy and our exhibition program going forward. So I think more specific uh, to the question, which I'm reading again here in the queue is what is the best way to advocate for the underrepresented groups in collection development policies? I would say know your collection know your collection, study it, and make the case, a compelling case for why we need to fill the void. The truth is, as I've said in the presentation, we don't know what we don't know. So we're reliant upon those of you who may know, who may have a better sense of understanding to help those of us who are blind to see. Thank you for that answer. Um, so next question. Um, so what role do you envision for the division and for the Library of Congress more generally in terms of national leadership? That's a good question. You know, I envision a Library of Congress and more particularly an African and Middle Eastern division that is meaningful and relevant and representative of you know, just the American society in which we live. You know, when we think about national leadership, and we have to be mindful that the Library of Congress is um, the national library, but it is also the Library of Congress. So it's, it's something of a delicate walk in the sense that we are not necessarily taking a stance on the materials that we, um, collect the materials that are housed in our collections, but we instead are, go, are going deeper and wider and collecting even more so that it is accessible to the widest imaginable communities uh, possible. And through making those collections accessible, through creating platforms for conversations around those collections, we thereby have, I think, an even more significant presence on the national stage. Uh, 
for the go-to place, uh, along with our colleagues and peers who are on this call at other libraries around the world for brokering these critical topics. Thank you. I know we all look forward to working with you guys moving forward um, even more than we already do. Um, any more questions that anyone has? I wonder if if I could uh, ask a question about um, our roles as curators, librarians um, in these uh, cultural heritage institutions. And there have been a lot of conversations about um, whether we are neutral in this area or uh, or are we activists? I guess those are two kind of um, uh, maybe not polar opposites, but very different positions. But I wonder if you might elaborate on your your thoughts about which which pole you would gravitate toward more. Thank you. I think we aspire to neutrality, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, I. And I think it's difficult, you know, and I'm, I'm really trying to, to wonder whether or not it's aspirational as well, the sense of neutrality, because, you know, we each approach, and that's really what I was hoping to convey through the Zanella Muholi's image, that we each approach content through the narrow lens of our own understanding. And then we're working in institutions that were developed from very narrow perspectives. And so we're sort of chipping at the foundation and, and the walls of these institutions, sort of pushing you know, them to think more widely, to act more widely, to act more broadly. And, and part of that, again, means bringing our whole selves in and recognizing that when and where we do that work, we're also bringing with ourselves the, the conscious and the unconscious bias that we carry. So I think neutrality is, is notional, um, aspirational, uh, and the charge before us is to do our best to try to get there. And one way to do it again is through diversifying the playing field and the players. Thank you. Yeah, that has been a conversation among the, this group um, and as I'm sure it is among other groups uh, in our field and pre in years. So it's, it's good to hear your perspective on it. Um, do we have- Can I venture a yes, question? Yes. Okay, so the, the question that I would venture is actually one that came in the chat and just, sorry, sorry I'm nearly blind here. Uh, one that came in the chat about, um, here it is, the, this one about, uh, what role do I envision for the division and Library of Congress more generally in terms of national leadership? Well, I can't think of a better community to turn that question to. So I want, if I can, to borrow that question and put it to Mela, Mela's membership, Mela's leadership, to, to help uh, me in sort of understanding how you see the division and how you see us fulfilling our role as uh, a national leader. Uh oh, am I supposed to answer that? <laughs> it's fair game. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I um, we several of us, of course, uh, our various institutions, of course, work directly with um, the Library of Congress through the um, the MECAP acquisitions program. Um, that is probably the most obvious uh, uh, linkage between, you know, most of us and the Library of Congress. Um, uh, but, you know, um, in the past, um, there have been other sort of opportunities for working together. Like, for example, um, there's been several times when we've been able to hold our annual meeting in the Library of Congress um, campus, basically, in various parts of the buildings. Um, and that's always a, a nice opportunity to to really you know sort of uh, get to know everybody again and um, you know see what you guys are up to and that kind of thing. I um, I myself personally my one of my uh, plank one of the planks of my presidential platform um, for Mela this year is to definitely to increase um, our collaboration with other organizations external to us. 
uh, as, a, as a membership group. Um, you know, we are individual members. It's not an institutional membership group. So um, it's really a professional development kind of uh, organization. But um, there are gaps um, that, uh, you know, we've kind of lived with, but maybe, it's, you know, particularly now um, we could work to um, close. So I am actually already in communication with, uh, for example, the Africana Librarians Council um, about potentially doing something together in the coming year. Um, you know, in the past, we were limited uh, by, you know, when the few times like in the, you know, cosmic calendar when our two groups ever met in the same city, but we no longer have this limitation. So that's something that, you know, we can do. And Likewise, you know, theoretically, I hadn't really thought about it, but um, Mela and LC could collaborate on events um, and AMED in particular uh, events, speakers um, in the coming year. I mean, it, it's easy to do now. You know, it's so so many obstacles are removed that that we had to deal with before. Um, and there was oh, another one of my goals is also um, you mentioned the larger group Mesa and um, the you know the various. Uh, challenges and initiatives that that group faces and that's another one of my goals always has been to uh, develop a closer relationship with MESA. Uh, only I think barely 10% of MELA members are also members of MESA uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, but uh, anyway I would just say that the door to collaboration is wide open and it's uh, uh, you know the light is shining out there so let's go you know do it. So I uh, hope that sufficient. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I, I have a, um, something I've been thinking of too, uh, in sort of as specialist librarians, um, sometimes, actually many times our institutions are moving towards more generalization, right? Um, more generalization in collections, but especially more generalization in, in staff. Um, so one of the, one of the, um, things that I, I love about the Library of Congress is not only that they have all these international collections, but they also have experts in those international collections, uh, language experts, people with, with, with uh, the knowledge to go deep into those collections. Um, so uh, acting sort of as a beacon of, of the value of, of having not just these um, inclusive collections, but also staffing them with people who know deeply about about these areas of the world and these languages and these collections themselves um, and advocating for that in other institutions as well is 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 um, a way that I, I see um, the Library of Congress can really uh, be that be helpful for us. Oh, there's a thumbs up for that. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Ah, okay, I second. I'm reading the chat now. I, I I suppose everyone can see it, but me too. I second what Amanda is saying. Great, and thanks a lot. All right. Well, uh, Amanda, are we at time or? Yes, I was just going to say we might have time for one more question if anyone has anything. But otherwise, I think we can all take a coffee break before the next session. Um, not to discourage anyone. If there is one more question, feel free. This might be a comment more so than a question, but I really enjoyed uh, the artwork that you shared. And I think that something that I drew from it is that when we don't see the whole picture, what we focus on is hurt and scars and hardship and things like that. And I think that that really applies to the study of the Middle East. And I know in my education, um, everything is about conflict and you know, whether that's military conflict or political conflict, it always comes down to conflict. Um, and so I guess if I have a question that I can pull out of this, it's how can we as librarians in either through collection development or through our day-to-day -day work, shift the dialogue away from hurt, away from conflict and more towards the peaceable cultural enriching aspects. Jeez, that's, I mean, I feel like if I could answer that question, if we together 
can answer that question, we've got a Nobel laureate prize waiting for us. I mean, I, I really, I feel like that's, that's, that's probably the elephant in the room. And it really is about shifting the dialogue, you know, shifting the dialogue, the discourse of despair to, you know, one that really is more celebratory. And I, I, I mean, I, I guess in some ways I'm echoing um, Joshua, your, your, your sentiment here, and I'm doing it from a place of um, not answering the question, but rather sort of saying, let's join together and find an answer together because I really don't know. Um, but what I do know is that the devastating impact of perpetuating these discourses of, of despair, of, you know, in the case of my own work, Africa, the dark, dead, dying continent of corruption, you know, in, um, you know, the case of the Middle East, you know, a separate set of, you know, sort of, um, overbearing commentary that is not necessarily um, pulling out the, 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 the complexity of the, uh, of, of the region. Uh, it's a challenge. And one of the reasons why it's a challenge is because the, the repetitive nature of this discourse feeds the public imagination and it, and it, and it fosters stereotype and it fosters misunderstanding, which is in contradiction to everything that we are trying to do, which is to foster greater understanding. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but what I do know is that the work before us is to find it. The work before us is to continue to publish, to continue to speak, to continue to create platforms, sometimes platforms in places that uh, aren't, um, you know, the, the most ready stops on our journeys in the field. I mean, I think part of what we do in the field is we speak often to each other about each other. Uh. And, and, and we, we, for all intents and purposes, might know each other better than others know us. And so part of, I think, the challenge to sort of breaking down uh, uh, the, the, the discourses of despair is to, to have more conversations in more places with more people in broader ways. Uh, and that means you know, diversifying um, uh, not only our platforms, but also um, what we're pushing and where. I mean, this is a little um, uh, perhaps too reliant on, 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 on pop culture, but you know, I have to say that film, uh, The Black Panther, you know, what is it, Disney Marvel film, uh, The Black Panther did so, 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 so much to help create an alternative image of what Africa could look like. Now it's a, you know, a, a fictitious place. There's no Wakanda, but in the public realm now, there is a hunger for more understanding about whatever might be equivalent to a Wakanda. It's no longer, you know, the, the starving child or the, you know, corrupt dictator that is the single most, you know, focus on, you know, the conversation about Africa, but instead, you know, this, this hero figure and this fictive place. Well, I think in our field uh, as curators and scholars and librarians, we are in positions to sort of basically create the real world image of what is, is, is out there most parallel to, um, you know, the likes of a Wakanda. Uh, and so I, I draw on that example because I, I think it's, it, it, it helps to illustrate my point that, um, We've got to find a way, frankly, to demystify the language of scholarship and put it in the hands of as many people as possible in as uh, wide a variety of ways as possible. And that helps to shift the narrative a little bit. Thank you for taking a run at what I acknowledge is probably an unanswerable question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, I just wanted to throw out something that, that um, a presentation on Monday by Dr. Fyodorov on the Herning cross-cultural links between Orthodox Christians in um, Syria and Romania, and those kinds of cross-cultural among different 
or between different religious communities and different ethnic groups, I think could be a way of also addressing this question. Um, I remember reading, what was it, Philip Jenkins's Lost Christianities years ago, and it opened my eyes onto the world of the Nestorians and the Assyrian churches that Dr. Kitchener had mentioned. I knew nothing about. It was really fascinating, the history of those groups, their um, outreach and missionary activity in Asia, um, and then the fact that representatives came to medieval Europe. Um, and things like that, I think, could also be helpful for changing the image of conflict to one of building up and sharing um, aspects of civilization. Also, I want to mention different, you know, library model. Uh, it was um, uh, applied in Europe. It started in Europe. It is a living library program. Uh, it started in Denmark and uh, people not just checking out books, also checking out people from different, you know, the cultures. And the main idea was challenging, you know, the stereotyping or, you know, stigma or prejudice. So, Meanwhile, many, you know, the different people from different cultures, uh, different, you know, the values or identities, they got together, they, and then they initiate the conversation. So I think this kind of, you know, the model also inspires uh, many others, you know, the libraries in the United States. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. And also it, it brings another point to mind, um, which is that, you know, for those of us who are in large, um, complex, and in some cases bureaucratic institutions, you know we are a little less nimble than some of our colleagues and peers who are doing work in the independent arena. And so I think there's a lot to learn in terms of uh, how to be even more innovative, how to be even more flexible uh, when we start looking at some of the smaller independent institutions, cultural institutions and libraries that uh, frankly, in some instances, just by the sheer nature of their being, which is that often they are not well resourced, often they are not well staffed, often they don't have all of the attributes that um, come with, you know, a large library like the Library of Congress or, you know, Harvard University libraries or Smithsonian libraries, uh, but that as smaller operations, um, they, they, they are able to do some of the work that you would think we would be able to do in bigger spaces, but may find challenge with doing. And so as we talk about cross-cultural uh, collaborations, I think it might also do well to think in terms of cross-institutional collaborations. Um, and that means pushing beyond, you know, Ivy Leagues, Research One, top shelf institutions with all the resources, but looking at what, for example, is happening by way of the very small libraries, independent libraries that are popping up uh, and cultural institutions that are popping, popping up in, in the world, in the countries and regions that we represent. I think well, a lot can be there. Thank you so much, Dr. Kitchener, for your talk and for answering all of our questions. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who, for coming. Uh, we're, we're so grateful to have a large audience for our keynote. Um, and if you're interested in the rest of our uh, in the rest of our series, um, the link I'm going to share my screen real quick. The link is right here. Um, and uh, hopefully you join us November 19th and every month after that. And uh, thank you so much again to Dr. Kitchener for making the time to be here with us. Today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, and I want to add my thanks at the end here. And um, uh, just to remind everybody that we will begin again at 12.15 um, with, uh, we will continue with our uh, program on social justice and decolonization of the library. So I hope to see you all back after you've had a chance to freshen up. So um, thanks very much again, Dr. Kitchener. Um, this was terrific. Uh, we were just getting warmed up. I'm so sorry to, to cut it off, but um, we will have time to continue the conversation. So thanks again. Thank you. Okay. Thank see you. you. All the best, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay.